Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to our Road to Recovery series of panel discussions. We expect our future actions to be impacted by our learnings from this crisis, and these would play out as we set out to achieve accelerated recovery, as well as build stronger barriers against future risk. Today is the first of our five-part series where we cover working capital, new ideas, and future approach. Our panelists will bring to bear their experience to deliberate a future approach to managing working capital. A little bit about ASA and Associates and our guests today. ASA and Associates is a 30-year-old accounting and consulting firm with a team of over 700 professionals spread across eight offices in India, besides a well-oiled network of national and international affiliations. We work with our clients, many from overseas, to help them set up offices and factories in India, find partners, take care of their taxation, audit, accounting and business support requirements, GST advisory, risk advisory services, and help with restructuring and liquidations as well. Chairing our panel today is Sudeep Bandapadhyaya. Sudeep is the group chairman of Indie Trade Group of Companies, leaders in the fintech space focused on leveraging technology to serve the financially underserved and marginalized. A chartered accountant, a cost accountant, with over 32 years of rich experience across various areas of finance and financial services. Sudeep was earlier the head of treasury and strategic investments at ITC, managing director of Reliance Securities, board member of several Reliance ADA group companies, and was managing director and CEO of Destimony. Our first panelist today is S. Ranganathan, the group CFO of Edelweiss Financial Services, one of India's leading diversified financial services conglomerates, a chartered accountant, cost accountant, company secretary, and Bachelor of General Law with 33 years experience driving strategic planning and financial management across accounting, taxation, statutory compliances, budgetary control, fundraising, and investor relations. His earlier stints were with GL Hotels, Citigroup, and Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Our second panelist today is Sushant Pai, the CFO at Matrimony.com Limited, India's first pure play consumer internet company to be listed and a pioneer in online matchmaking services. An experienced finance leader with over 20 years of experience across technology, finance and advisory domains, Sushant has led organization-wide transformational strategic initiatives from organizational structure optimization to restructuring of business operations. His earlier stints were at KPMG, GE Capital and Mindtree. Our third panelist, Sanjay Agarwal, is the CFO of Jyoti Labs, a multi-brand, fast-moving consumer goods company with various leading home and personal care brands such as Ujala, Margo, Henko, etc. A chartered accountant and cost accountant with over 20 years experience across consulting and investment banking, he is also an alumnus of the Executive Development Program at Wharton Business School. His earlier stints were with Arthur Anderson, HDFC Chubb, Edelweiss Capital, Macquarie Capital, and Adani Capital. Our final panelist today is Nitin Arora, who leads the transaction advisory services at ASA and Associates. He carries tremendous experience in partner search, business valuations, due diligence, business negotiations, and strategies. He is a board member to MA Worldwide, a network of over 40 international investment banking firms across the world. He has worked on many buy and sell mandates across industries and has worked extensively with both PE and strategic clients on inbound and outbound instructions, uh, transactions. Before we begin, here are a few instructions for the webinar. Please note that all participants will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the question section in the chat. The presentation will be followed by Q&A. A link to the recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow afternoon. Please note that each of these five webinars have a separate link, and that will be emailed to you on the day of the webinar. Kindly reach out to us if you are having any difficulty with this. Thank you, and over to you, Sudeep. Thank you, Kim. Welcome, everybody. A very, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, working capital is such an interesting and, you know, time immemorial concept. And we see webinars happening on pretty much, uh, you know, so many exciting and interesting topics, but very few uh, webinars or very few discussions happen on uh, working capital. So when Mr. Ajay Sethi, the managing partner of uh, ASA Associates, 
spoke to me, I jumped at the opportunity because, you know, I feel that for finance professionals, for treasuries, for CFOs, and for the MDs and CEOs, working capital is, is and going to be a very, very critical component of managing businesses efficiently. COVID, pandemic, lockdown, whatever name uh, we may choose to call, have taught us new lessons, and that applies to pretty much everybody. In this backdrop, how we take forward our businesses, how we handle and manage working capital, how we benefit out of it, I think that's going to be the focus of this discussion. Now, remember, you know, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, the eminent uh, you know, author and economist, spoke about Black Swan a few years back. But this is much, much bigger than any Black Swan anybody could have imagined. So the learnings obviously are of a completely uh, on, a, on a different scale. And fortunately, today we have a panel which consists of leading players from the FMCG, e-commerce, financial services, and professional uh, consulting and advisory uh, firms. So I'm sure we'll have a very, very interesting discussions. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm sure all of you will enjoy this session too. Uh, maybe I'll, instead of uh, continuing my monologue, I will involve my panelists and start the dialogue with them. And let me start by asking maybe uh, from the you know traditional manufacturing FMCG industry, Mr. Sanjay Agarwal, uh, a question. Uh, Sanjay, how did you handle your working capital during the COVID days, during the lockdown period? And uh, you know uh, why don't you tell us about it? Thanks, Sudeep. Thanks a lot, and thanks ASA for organizing this discussion. So. <laughs> It is very natural instinct of every human being uh, during a crisis to assume the worst. And on March 23rd, <clears throat> when the nationwide lockdown happened, we thought everything is will be frozen and things were standstill. But it is also the same human nature to persevere. It is during this crisis, only when innovations come to forefront, that we had only one week before the year end closing. So we were able to mobilize all over our India sales team, quickly restart our manufacturing operations. So the point I want to just address here is that all fears don't come true if you are agile and if you have a hunger to excel. Second, we are all going through this crisis and everybody has been impacted in some form or the other. So there is no playbook to take a guidance and we can say, okay, you know, let's do it this way or not, don't do it this. So bad things can also, the one thing which we learned is bad things can also happen even to good companies. So, and risk, even if whatever best risk consulting or, you know, risk advisory uh, we have in our companies, it is impossible to eliminate it. So my only advice is what we have uh, done and what we tell everybody is don't run out of cash. Now, all of us are ambitious and we have to do sometimes ordinary things in an extraordinary manner. So the, we have always learned that we need to reduce working capital. That is all we learned as a finance professionals. But here I'm saying that what differentiates a great company from a good is a business that besides practicing these good practices also focuses on relationships. So on March 23rd, when we changed our gears and we said, considering the difficulties our distributors were facing, we extended credit to them. And we paid or we upfront paid to all our creditors before their credit period as they needed funds to tide over the crisis. So we took that hit on working capital for a longer term benefit. So this relationship gesture uh, Sudeep and all my panelists will appreciate that that helped us to resume our operations in April because we were the first one to get the stocks from them. So once again, I'll close it, uh, close it by saying don't run out of cash, whether it is your personal life or professional life. Thank you, Sanjay. I think that's an excellent lesson. I just switch gears and move to the new economy, the internet and uh, you know, Shushant. Uh, you come absolutely right there. Uh, you 
you know, you know, probably all of us who run brick and mortar businesses had to kind of sit at home for a long time. But you guys are online services. So did you guys, uh, you know, what did you guys do differently? What did you guys do? And what was the working capital scenario? Maybe you guys benefited. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sudeep. Uh, thanks, ASA, for this opportunity as well. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, being an internet company, we all think, you know, everything is online, nothing will happen. And that's the first thing, right? Everybody thinks. Uh, but you can see the amount of dynamics that go behind an even internet company as well. So I'm a first time CFO, uh, but I think I can confidently say that uh, all CFOs were on the same boat at this time, right? At this crisis. So I can confidently say that. And Sudip uh, uh, and Sanjay uh, alluded to it well. I think apart from people's safety, security, protection and all of that, I think the first thing that comes to our mind is cash. Right, so that's the first thing. Though we had enough cash reserves, uh, the thing that came to our mind is how do we not deplete the cash reserves? So that's the other way to look at it, you know. And if cash reserves get depleted, the first thing that comes to your mind is should we borrow? So in a way that even though we had cash reserves, I did make a call to our bankers saying that, you know, is the line of credit open? You know, are there things okay? Now, suppose we want to draw down something, are we okay? So that's the first call we made, even though we were okay. So I think that's what crisis also opens up, you know, to say, you know, what are the avenues we can look at? The second thing is that uh, while we are talking about people, you know, the government suddenly brought a rule, at least in Tamil Nadu and Chennai, saying that all paying guest accommodations will be closed, right? Uh, it may be a small rule, but you know many of our people were staying in these sort of accommodations so all of them overnight had to leave for their hometowns and therefore you know within a few days we actually shifted desktops brought new laptops because for us uh, customer connectivity was in important even though it's an internet company uh, you know what happens is our customers come to our platform register for free but to convert them to paid they all require human touch so what happens when a whole lot of people leave the city and they are also grappling with emotions, right? What do you do then? So we learned from our earlier lessons during the Chennai floods. We actually developed an in-house app and that's where technology comes to the rescue, right? So the minute people reached home, they were able to connect with our customers through that in-house app. So they didn't need to come through the, you know, the old dialer system that we had in our office. So that we made it handy within few days or rather first week or second week of March, we reacted to that because we didn't see what was coming through. So that's one thing that we uh, did really well. The second thing is that uh, working capital, one of the key things to look at is costs, right? Uh, and one thing that we all learned is uh, in this situation, uh, we have to negotiate with people. And when I mean negotiate, uh, I'm saying in the positive sense, right? Here, I want the other side to win. I want myself to win as well. So we have a lot of office spaces, retail outlets and all of that. So we went on a massive you know, spree to say that, how do we get the best out of it without hurting the other side? And you know, uh, to our surprise, the other side actually came out, you know, uh, you know, willingly and said, yes, we can help you because we are all in it together. Because the other side also knows that if we don't, you know, if we move out of that location, it will be very difficult for them to get something straight away, right? So I think one of the learnings or one of the things that we did was negotiate every cost. And we'd, we had a lot of rigor in this. The third thing I would say is uh, look at a specific channel that doesn't yield so much in these uh, uh, in these times. So for example, for us, we had 140 retail outlets. So you can see, uh, you started off saying we are an internet company, but we also have the brick and mortar way. Okay, we have small retail outlets in neighborhoods where parents can come and register in those outlets. So we said, look at those outlets, can we reduce them? You know, can we shut down some because they are very small, people can anyway not come to these outlets. So I think the thing that we did is we reacted very fast, which helped in our working capital because revenues did take an impact. And that was the same for everyone, whether it's an internet company or a brick and mortar. The only way to actually handle working capital or do a good job of working capital was to look at the cost. And that's what we did. 
AMCs or any other means. And uh, in fact, uh, it actually helped us to increase profitability in quarter one as compared to quarter four, which was actually a surprise to us. So you can see what crisis does in all of these situations. Fantastic, Shushan. I think absolutely correct. I think now I'm left with two gentlemen in the panel who are actually dealing with probably all of uh, you know, the, 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 the industry, whether it's uh, online or offline. So let me go to uh, uh, Ranga first. I think financial services has kind of seen pretty much everything over the last, what, two years since ILFS fiasco. And I think COVID was a kind of a last nail uh, there, I would say. And I think you guys have gone through, everybody has gone through a whole lot of things. So Ranga, how did you manage the COVID crisis? What is it that you did to ensure that the, you know, the kitchen uh, continues functioning? So thanks, uh, thanks Sushan, and thanks ESA for giving me this opportunity. Uh, well, uh, my uh, I've heard the earlier panelists Sanjay and Sushan, and uh, I would uh, now go in with financial services, which would rather sound a little more pessimist than. Uh, uh, what um, the words Sushant and uh, Sanjay have been using, uh, because the experience has been pretty bad. And you described this uh, as uh, a black swan event or a much more than a black swan event. Now, uh, unfortunately, we don't call it working capital in the financial services segment. We call by all other jargons except working capital. We call it liquidity management. We call asset liability uh, mismatches. We call it gaps. We call it contingency reserve. We call it contingency fund and several other things, uh, but uh, uh, end of the day, it's all working capital in that sense. Now, this uh, particular event has hit uh, the financial services company uh, in a variety of forms, because the financial services itself is a very diverse kind of a thing. Then you have uh, an NBFC, which will be uh, lending money. You will have a housing finance company, which will be um, uh, by and large into the mortgage and the SME kind of a business. You'll have an asset uh, reconstruction company which will be doing a, a different thing. You have an insurance company which will behave differently in a particular uh, way. Mutual funds and asset management funds will have a different kind of an impact on this. Broking companies, by and large, uh, were uh, left untouched by this because uh, that's uh, pretty much what is the scene of the market. So, having said that, a uh, variety of things have uh, happened to a variety of uh, companies in the financial services sector. Having said that, one of the important things which we should know is uh, largely this financial services segment, although there may be a, a couple of uh, regulators who are governing them, it's highly uh, tight rope in the sense that the working capital management uh, has been prescribed by regulators and they do a checking all times. Given that, the impact of that has been very marginal in this and we have stayed. Even a back swan event, the companies have lived through that, starting from ILFS all the way to COVID. And I just hope that this is the last, as you rightly mentioned. So now let's look at how is that impacted uh, 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 the most uh, impacted part of the financial services. Uh, one is uh, what could go wrong will go wrong. What cannot go wrong will also go wrong. So that's what is the first teaching that uh, this particular event has taught us. The second, I'll come to that later, uh, but uh, the two important things that we should know is uh, there are two ways in which this got impacted. One is the customer will not pay. The customer does not pay because the business is impacted, all kinds of businesses, whether he is in employment, whether he is in the small businesses or even in the uh, large businesses, many of the industries got impacted. So the liquidity was a constraint. So you will not get it. The second one is the banks or the providers of liquidity will take an extreme view in this and given the economic instability at this point in time, they will not be open to take any kind of risk. So therefore you will have, you will have the impact of working capital on two fronts. So uh, that's, uh, uh, I, if I could summarize the impact of COVID on uh, the working capital of a financial, a typical financial services segment. Uh, there could be, we could go much detail in what uh, you want to describe and how uh, we could handle it, but. Understandable. I think, I think you guys face pressure from both the sides, supply as well as demand. I think both the sides you guys face pressure. But coming to the thing, I think professional services firms have a different set of challenges, I'm sure, during that entire, this COVID 
and lockdown period. You know, we would love to hear from your experiences. How did you manage this period? And you know, what, how, how have you been carrying out since then? Thank you, Sudeep, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Sudeep, to answer your question, I think uh, like most, uh, most uh, professional services firm, close to 30 to 40 percent of our revenue actually comes in or billing comes in the last quarter of the financial year. So this was a double whammy event for us because when the lockdown was announced in uh, you know end of March, most of our billing which we were expected to collect got stuck because people had genuine reasons. They were not in office. There was a panic all over. So we had an unprecedented amount of outstanding you know, on 31st March, which would normally we would collect in the last 15 days. And then to top it up, you know, April and May anyways are a slow period for us. You know, the billings are typically low. So we were left with a very precarious situation with a big outstanding which was to be collected, nothing in the bank and no further billing happening. So it actually shook us. What we did was basically two things. So first of all, we made a task force. We decided, okay, we normally make our budgets on an annual six monthly basis. We said, okay, let's do a monthly budgeting. So we did a monthly cash flow analysis and we decided which cost to incur, when to incur, what to defer, what not to defer. So I think the motor was extreme, extreme detailed scrutiny of each and every line item. So two things we did. A, on the revenue side, we did a detailed analysis of each and every outstanding and say we have to get it come what may, you know, go to the normally, you know, you're a bit relaxed. Okay, it comes in more than 60 days, whether it is 30 days, 60 days, go and request for a payment. Monitor your cash every day. In fact, Ajay used to take a cash position every morning at 10 a.m as to what to do because it's a very you know a different situation and on the expenses side you know what we did was that and i totally uh, you know kind of uh, echo what sushant and sanjay have said what we did was we decided that if we have to go to our key stakeholders which are our employees which are landlords which are our key vendors go with a human emotion attached to it you know let's not give anybody a pain which is too big at one point in time let's try to do a win-win situation in which we spread that over a period so that you win, I win. So for example, most of our landlords, we didn't go and ask it, okay, give us three months rental discount or give us 100%. We agreed a structure, okay, give us 15% or a 10% spread over the year. We are happy to increase lock-in some places. We are happy to do a structure in which you do not, your working capital is also managed, our working capital is also managed. So it was a more inclusive approach, which we did and which helped us. So none of our employees were laid off, none of our office has got closed. So I would say at the end of the day, it is all about very, very detailed cash flow management. Now, what I've said is not any rocket science, with it, but I think when the times are good, you typically ignore these things. You know, nobody monitors cash on a daily basis, especially in our companies. So I think it was an extraordinary time which called for an extraordinary effort. And I would say for six months, we have been uh, reasonably okay to weather the storm. And I think the next six months will have its own story to play. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. I think. You know what, what you mentioned uh, strikes a chord. We were been monitoring cash flows on a daily basis, and I'm sure some of uh, my panelists also would have been doing the same thing. Just like you mentioned, I was monitoring on a daily basis. We were monitoring on a daily basis. I mean, we found there is absolutely no other way because we had a very large microfinance business where the collections became zero. You just couldn't go. It's a lockdown, and it's a physical mode of collection. So you just couldn't go. So two months we had zero collection almost from this entire channel. So we had to monitor by default the cash flows very, very closely. Yes, different, different lessons. So coming back to you, uh, I think, uh, you know, you guys, uh, you mentioned that Q1 uh, was very interesting. You did better than Q4, which is actually very few people in the industry can say that. And uh, uh, you guys did a fabulous job of that. And we talked about cost management which gave you a significant muscle up. Uh, but tell me that, what are the lessons? Did you guys, uh, you know, learn something in this entire COVID uh, issue, the lockdown related issue? And, and how do you take it forward? What are the opportunities you guys are seeing? Yeah, Sudeep, uh, interesting question. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Warren Buffet's uh, uh, statement. Uh, he said once, uh, someone's sitting in the shade today because few years back, somebody planted a tree, right? Uh, and that's what I'm reminded of in these times. And also reminded of a statement uh, made by Jim Collins in his book called Built to Last. 
he said uh, you have to embrace the genius of the ant and he says uh, when you embrace the genius of the ant you start doing both ends of the spectrum well so for example he says in these times it's good to be conservative and bold okay it's good to have short term and long term so what it means is that you have to think of both and you have to think of both and do both very well i think that was one of the learnings that i had during this course saying that this crisis you should think of both extremes let me give you one or two examples of my learnings for example this industry the we, we are in whatever happens marketing costs are a big lever because only when we spend a lot on marketing more and people more people know about it and come onto our platform so the competition was also not relenting on marketing costs so you can imagine there is a crisis going on we are all scrambling all over the place but there is one cost which is not relenting so what we did is yes you have to negotiate on all other costs such that something can be invested back into marketing so in a way i was uh, you know taking the route of balancing the short term and the long term so rather what i'm saying is you need to do both even in these situations so you need to be conservative in some things you need to take bold calls in some things so that's one of the lessons which that i learned the second thing is i think uh, many times when we plan a scenario planning right we take the worst case scenario as very likely i think this is a situation that we all i think took the worst case scenario very seriously obviously you know we pray that the worst case scenario does not happen but i think the simulation is very important to do a worst case scenario uh, the third lesson is that uh, like i told you earlier i think it's good to have a mindset in these times that everything is negotiable right we cannot take anything for granted everything is negotiable everything can be done because the party on the other side is also in the same situation nobody is insulated from this pandemic so everything is negotiable uh, the fourth thing uh, which really helped us is the power of data right in our industry in our internet industry the power of data is humongous uh, it helped us to take calls on a daily basis because every day i knew what happened the previous day so the power of data really helped us so i think these were some of the learnings uh, during this times and like we say that in any of these learnings we need to prepare for the future right so we continue on these basis like the way we learn from the chennai floods and use technology to create an app which helped which uh, which came in very handy during these times uh, we are taking some of the learnings in uh, in the way forward as well like for example like i said the power of data uh, made us realize that we can be much more productive and efficient which we didn't realize in normal times okay and just by tweaking some things i think we were able to become much more productive and efficient and those metrics now become the metrics of the future so that's broadly i think uh, my learnings and what we see uh, as a future for uh, you know in an internet industry you know that's excellent shashank i think uh, you know the, the reliance on data i think that brings me to probably ranga once again uh, you know for the financial services industry the way forward the way you in this out based on the lessons we have you know gathered during the last i would say financial services industry is little longer than covid uh, maybe the reliance on data maybe the trying to predict the customer defaults customer intelligence gathering how how how, how are you guys playing it out uh, uh, right uh, the large part of the data uh, the models that you create which are true from a retail customer and the consumer kind of a loan perspective uh, a large part of this would come from your own empirical experiences and you create your own data on what kind of customers would pay what kind of customers would react in a particular way in a particular situation so all those data is here really useful now uh, another set of data which is very useful in building these kind of models is the credit bureau uh, scores and uh, credit bureau uh, data which people keep uh, putting in but uh, let me be very frank sudeep i don't want to be under a mistaken impression uh, uh, and give the only the brighter side the credit data uh, we couldn't do much from it because the data itself was uh, incomplete uh, they were quite dated because the behavior of the customer 
during COVID was very different from what it was earlier. So we couldn't just estimate and go forward against that. Having said that, uh, there are some quick lessons that you learned. Uh, you are you have to be very agile in embracing the new reality. As I mentioned to you, a customer will default and you will get into a situation where the regulator also prescribes and adds to your complexity, adds to your complications. In the sense that you have seen a typical example of an NBFC where the NBFC were required to give moratorium to its customers, but the NBFC will not get moratorium from its banks. So if that is the situation, then we are in for deep trouble. So therefore, going forward, what you should be doing is you should anticipate these kind of things happening. Make yourself, make your uh, working capital, redefine your working capital cycle, redefine your liquidity management practices, and so that you take into account that there is going to be a delay, be prepared, brace yourselves for an elongated working capital cycle for your business. So that's an important lesson that we the second and the important one, uh, which uh, some of the banks have done very well, and we have also done it, but uh, let me give the credit to one of the foreign banks who have done it. They have been interacting with the customer. The customer over outreach during this period has been phenomenal. Uh, in the sense, uh, for in our own case, the last five months, we would have reached out to so many customers that we would not have reached out in the last two years. The reason for that is you go and educate the customer. That's how your collection sort of picked up. Now, uh, just resonating to what Sushan said, the collections, once the moratorium was announced, everybody wanted moratorium because nobody wanted to pay. So uh, it was a free money, so Qdena. So that's what is the philosophy. So the collections for the first two months was something like 24%. Or if a person has to pay 100 rupees, if the total collection was to be 100, it was. You picked up about 24 in the first two months and then you go down and educate the people saying that hey guys this is not free money you are required to pay interest uh, and uh, in all probabilities you may have to pay the interest on interest the moratorium advantage that uh, the regulator is giving is going to remain only for a few months and then you will have to come back and things have to you will have to pay the money you can't go uh, out from here number one Number two is uh, after two months, there were the lockdowns were sort of lifted in a limited way. So people started going back. It was not, uh, it was chutti for the first two months, but it was no more a vacation after two months. So people had to go back and they sense that things will come back to normalcy. So they will still have to repay the loan. They will still have to earn their livelihood. So that kind of an education was required and that was provided by uh, many of the financial institutions and a few of the foreign banks did it very well. They used to call up customers every uh, 10 days, understand uh, where they are going, how, what are their, how they are doing in their own uh, families. So uh, it was very difficult. I mean, there are so many number of customers going into lakhs and uh, uh, millions of customers, calling each of them and getting the data was a tough thing to do, but then they did that, and uh, that's the reason why the collections have sort of now gathered up. We are now almost about 65% of normal from what it was about 20-24% uh, in April. Excellent, I think uh, you know that brings me to another uh, interesting uh, area which I have always wanted to understand. Uh, Nitin, you guys have been advising clients, and uh, you know MA has been one of your areas of expertise. Now, with this experience behind us or with us, I would say, how would you, uh, you know, advise clients uh, on working capital uh, you know, during an MA transaction? Sure, Sudipan, I'm glad, uh, very glad you asked this question because uh, this matter is the working capital in MA is a subject matter of contention on most of the transactions which we do. Now, uh, to go a little bit technical, when you value a company, the enterprise value of any company includes its tangible assets, which is your fixed assets, include your working capital and the intangible assets. Now, what happens is that uh, when you are doing a valuation, you assume a normalized working capital to be part of the deal. And uh, when you, uh, so two issues emerge out of it. One, if there are some items in the working capital which are not good, I would say they are, they are not collectible. 
then they needs to be adjusted in the valuation going forward because if you're doing a valuation and you realize in due diligence some working capital which you assume making an offer is not there you would adjust it the bigger issue is the movement of working capital between two dates you know so for example when you are valuing a company you assume the normalized working capital but at the time you're handing over the keys you know you're renting the house if the working capital has changed significantly you go back to the discussion of adjusting that you know you promise x now you're delivering less so this is another typical issue we face but moving into the covid scenario you know why they become even more important is because let's say example where a company you know did a transaction you're negotiating a transaction and you assume a particular working capital to be part of the deal now if that particular working capital and let's say debtors there are huge debtors and because of covid your debtors are not able to pay or they ask a significant discount on a dollar your significant amount of working capital will require a write off which would then basically mean a renegotiation of price and the bigger issue is that let's say that working capital is no longer collectible and you are entering that company you need to then invest that equal amount of capital in the company as a fresh equity whether you readjust it from the payout of the promoter or whatever you do so basically i think if you talk about m&a and working capital anyways it's a very big issue uh, how do you adjust it but with covid the intricacies of not collecting and the swelled up working capital because of genuine reasons people not paying up will have its further complications when you are renegotiating the deal so buyers need to be very careful specific, specifically to do a closing due diligence closer to the date to see that your assumptions when you made an offer hold true or no and if no then how do you adjust it how do you make sure that you know you arrive at an amicable this thing when you are entering into a company so that's what i will feel is very very important from an m and a perspective so excellent nitin i think uh, you know the learnings from different uh, uh, businesses and learnings from consultancy makes us rich how to manage working capital but i think by and large the consensus is coming that one thing we have learned is that we need to maintain probably much more uh, much higher levels of liquidity than what we were doing pre covid pre you know the crisis scenario let me bring in sanjay quickly because uh, his industry is a little different from what we do and that's a traditional part of the uh, you know ecosystem sanjay you know are you guys going to do things differently in any manner uh, now that we have kind of covered the the worst part of the covid and the lockdown to see uh, we always say that see and we had this discussion is on working capital see working capital is like a pulse now um, it shows the how the business has been operating effectively efficiently or not so every industry requires a different level of working capital uh, financial services is different than from a e-commerce and then from a uh, fmcg type of companies we have our, on a negative working capital in that manner so i think uh, when you see any company's results and annual report and see the level of working capital it gives you some sense of how well that company is getting operated that is one point now second is will we change anything <clears throat> i think again i'll go back to a very small, and you know i'm just leading to the point where shushant was saying that sometimes it is not only to win but it is to make uh, create a win win i'll i'll give you a live example the way uh, we do it before this thing and even pandemic and now also is we take the help of these relationships when we are launching these new products so we go to our vendors and we ask for a superior pricing from them and so whatever cost comes down we are able to launch our products at far competitive rates now this and whatever money we have saved what shushant was saying we will put towards the advertisement of the same product and more like most likely the product will become a hit and the vendors will also gain out of it so all i'm trying to say at the end of the day it is not only we these are all our business partner whether these are our distributors whether these are our vendors and if you only think that we you want to win it's not possible so you have to create while you are running the business which is the most liquid part of it is you know your working capital you have to make a win win situation for all the business partners oh that's it that's it so i'll i'll just quickly because we don't have too much of time i will quickly come back to uh, shushant maybe for a minute then do you guys envisage in the new 
post covid world significant increase in opportunities for your business and thereby having a positive uh, impact on the working capital cycle yeah uh, so like i said we did have some impact in terms of business during covid uh, but uh, you know during this times you know we'll have to really prepare the ecosystem for the future and uh, when i mean by that a uh, few things that we did i think will help us regain some of the lost territory in the future uh, let me give you uh, some examples right one during covid uh, for some for some time we saw a little bit of a drop but after that we saw a surge in profiles coming into our system i realized that maybe that's because people are just sitting at home right they want to register themselves and finally people realize that in our industry marriage is a process right you cannot just get married tomorrow i think at some point they realize it's a process it may take 9 months it may take 12 months so why not register i'm just sitting at home let's see what happens so i think what is happening in the humans race is that slowly people are trying to adapt even from that right so when as people adapt people like us also adapt right i think that's the big thing as we go along so we suddenly saw a surge in profiles and we were surprised thinking that how come in pandemic we are seeing such a huge surge in profiles so that's one thing so definitely i think that things are going to come back slowly uh, people are finding ways and means to say that at some point i will need to get married so in from that context it is coming back the second thing is i think like people adapt we are also trying to help people adapt by doing new things for example uh, we didn't have a video calling feature in our website so obviously you can do video calling through whatsapp and all of that but to develop something like that for our customers is something new for us we didn't have it earlier so which also shows tells a customer you know you can do these features and not necessarily have to meet the person just like everybody is adapting right somebody who's selling anything now is doing a virtual session you know for selling things so i think adapting to newer technology such that you help the customer is also regaining you know some of the lost confidence uh, that we had uh, the third thing is continuously how do you change subscription models in our cases uh, for example uh, during covid times that uh, you know when the lockdown was announced for 21 days uh, we said we'll give a 21 day extension to customers on the subscription now it could have been 20 days or it could have been 25 days but the nation knows 21 right so we had to capture that 21 and say we'll give a 21 day extension because you know you're under lockdown you're not going to do much during that and all of that so i think some of the reactions that we did during those days has helped us and now since that things have opened up people have understood that uh, and also like i said since we continuously invested in marketing some of the benefits we are reaping as we go along and some of the cost benefits that we also spoke about we are reaping so i think uh, uh, you know our confidence level is much better than what it used to be that is also because i think the key ingredient is that the people have learned to react to things like all of us sanjay so, so very quickly uh, is the rural uh, regeneration rural upswing uh, that's for real and is it helping you guys in your working capital amongst others yeah i think that's the only silver lining uh, sudeep we see today uh, because uh, 70% of india still lives in rural and 50% of the population is dependent on agriculture so two good things have happened one monsoons have been very thank i mean god has been kind and you know monsoons have been good so <clears throat> both the kharif and the rabi season i mean uh, sowing has been good so they are they are prosperous in that manner they are not dependent on any you know money lenders and things like that so therefore the consumption demand is good the second is i think government has been very proactive they have been right from the day when you know these sops have been announced government has been given uh, through various forms uh, you know money to the rural people and because of the dbt now the money is going directly in their hands and the recent uh, uh, the the farm bill which has come with this will revolutionized uh, the way uh, agriculture or the farm farmers have been selling their produce so <clears throat> i think there have been these structural good things which have happened and it is very good for the country that they also participate in overall you know uh, growth of the country so we are very positive and very happy that uh, now i think next few years a decade will be very good for india in that manner so we are seeing yes 
rural demand has been uh, inching better than the urban, which is a very good sign for all of us. Thanks, thanks, Sanjay. Ranga, quickly, very quickly, uh, is your retail, uh, you know, behaving in a much better, better manner compared to the corporate uh, business? And uh, you know, is this working capital favorable, or would you have preferred it the other way around? Uh, well, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the wholesale has been uh, doing all, not all that great, not just uh, post-COVID, even pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, uh, the retail was good. Pre uh, retail has come down uh, in the first uh, two or three months and now has again gone back and picked up uh, retail. Now, we don't see that kind of a, a, a uptick in the wholesale side. The wholesale has been pretty much uh, with uh, issues relating to uh, real estate, uh, more so touched by the real economy. And unless the projects come up, unless the projects get started in a big way, unless the sales start in a big way, we won't see uh, much of uh, uh, collections happening in the wholesale side. Now, uh, this pandemic has given two opportunities. One is positive, the other one is obviously negative. Uh, the uh, constructions have been delayed. Construction. The, let me start with the negative ones. The, the co constructions have been delayed. Uh, uh, people, the workers have left their uh, workplace and they've gone back to their villages. And now it will take a lot of time for them to come back. While we are seeing some kind of uh, emergence back into their workplace, but it will take some time. Uh, that's one. Number two, the working capital required by uh, these construction uh, uh, builders will need some more uh, positive steps from the government or uh, from wherever the money has to come from the financiers. So once uh, only when that happens, will there be some kind of an uptick happening on the wholesale side. Uh, on the positive side, uh, there is uh, we have seen that a uh, lot of people uh, have started booking homes because the prices have crashed. M many many places, many new uh, projects are seeing uh, price corrections to the extent of almost 30 to 40 percent if you get to the liquid cash. If you have liquid money with you, uh, without uh, having any strings like Mera Purana Ghar Bechna Hai and all those things, nothing of that kind. If you have ready money with you and you are getting about 30 35 percent discount, so people. As Sushant was talking about, that uh, here is an opportunity to create an asset uh, because some of the assets have become so cheap that uh, you may want to enter into at this point in time. So people are also looking at those who are positively inclined are looking at uh, building houses, uh, taking uh, moving from rented premises, rented houses to own houses, Having, uh, looking at bigger houses also because uh, my guess is uh, this work from home is going to live with us for a pretty long time. This cultural shift has already happened. So people who want to have one or two rooms as their offices within their homes, they would want to have contingencies like their own parents, old parents who are staying somewhere else who had a lot of difficult times during this COVID. The old parents had difficult times. The uh, nuclear family here had difficult times managing it. So it might make sense to have a bigger house so that uh, the two families can come together. So uh, there are many more tiny things. So answering your question simply, yes, retail is behaving better than wholesale. Excellent. Thanks, Anka. Nitin, one word, yes, no. The uh, m and activity, you expect to increase or decrease in the near term? I think uh, it's going to increase. I think we, I think I would not say, but uh, I think the worst should be behind us. The m and activity, we are seeing the uptick. We are requesting, uh, you know, we are receiving a lot of requests from companies who are looking at value buying and also overseas acquisition. So I am always positive, eternally positive, especially on M&A. So it should increase, it will increase. On that optimistic note, I think uh, we let's invite, I think we have a lot of questions coming from the uh, uh, people who have joined this webinar. Let's take uh, some questions. And, uh, uh, you know, one question which has come, uh, they, they, uh, the, the gentleman is thanking us for this session. And uh, he would like to know if there are any opportunities for the RBI to reduce the tenor uh, to one year under ECP for working capital. Uh, currently, the tenor is seven to 10 years, which is eventually becomes a high end cost due to longer tenure. Long tenures does not effectively turn out to be short term financing solution for general purposes, specifically if it is overseas funding. This is uh, from 
uh, Justina from SCB. Uh, would you guys like any of you like to take this up? I can try and answer it otherwise. So let me just uh, Ranga, would you like to add something before I say? No, no, no. no, no I, I said I mean, you should go uh, ahead. I was saying. Sudip, yeah. So I think. Uh, Carry on, Sudip. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, you know the whole objective of RBI when they allowed ECB was to attract long-term money into India. Uh, the regulator by nature is extremely wary of short-term foreign uh, money coming, uh, and I think that reluctance will not go in a hurry. So I am not really, really uh, optimistic that this can happen in the short term. There are ways and means of doing, uh, uh, bringing short-term money. But, well, if you ask me whether the regulator will reduce the tenure of ECB to one year uh, for managing short-term liquidity, probably the answer in the short term, why short? Short to medium term, no. Because regulators globally are extremely wary about money coming in from abroad and going out. So yes, uh, it is a challenge. I understand long-term uh, ECB with the currencies fluctuating, uh, it is a challenge, but that's what it is. Globally, that's the trend, I must tell you, uh, Justina, uh, we have to live with it. The second question, uh, which I would like the panelists to come uh, forward, uh, it has uh, seen working capital has been uh, squeezed during the last five, six months. Bankable amount is reduced. Bank should also come with some assessment of CC account. Yeah, maybe Sanjay. Yeah, so see, banks will only give money in these times to people who they think will survive through this crisis. You know, they also have their shareholders and they also have their depositors to pay. So I think it is, so there is no right or wrong answer in this, Sudeep. Uh, I think if you have been able to manage your ratings well during this time, and one of the things we always say is spend as lot of time with the rating agencies upfront, uh, help them to understand your businesses rather than just do once in a year exercise. Similarly with the banks, like we all are listed companies, at least on this panel, we spend a lot of time with our equity investors. Um, we should also give an equal amount of time to our debt banks and you know people from whom we borrow or can potentially uh, uh, borrow. So. I think it's about uh, uh, the relationship you have, the business potential you have, and you know what is your narrative? How, how, how has your experience been overnight? If you think like uh, how Shushan said, you know he picked up the phone and he spoke to a lot of people, and they said yes, we are available with our banking lines to you. It's about how you have behaved in the past, what your future potentials are. Uh, but uh, I think again here I would say uh, how can you prepare for future? Uh, one needs to spend a good amount of time with your banks and um, you know and maybe even spread with a lot of banks I'm not a lot of banks at least have multiple banks with you keep trying different products of theirs so you know they have experience with you when you know any situation arises but i i, I understand the challenge yeah why not Randa, you add just a couple of points I mean, just look at, uh, remove the socio-economic factor associated with COVID, but look at the monetary side. We are today in the best of working capital. The quantum of liquidity in the system is pretty high. Uh, the interest rates are pretty low. Uh, I mean, uh, we, I understand that RBI couldn't bring down the interest rate because it was already low. So that being the case, uh, the government is, government along with RBI is doing several things to make sure that we tide over this situation. I don't think there's any dearth of uh, working capital within India to warrant any kind of an external money coming in. And uh, interest rates uh, uh, along uh, along with the FX rates are uh, pretty much low. I mean, Ruby has been holding so strong. Yeah, absolutely right. There's one more question which has come, uh, which maybe Nitin, you can take it. How to control cash flow monitoring? Is there any ready-made software or just Excel? Would you like to do that, Nitin? Yeah, yeah. So, Deep, so I think uh, to best of my knowledge, there are no ready-made software because unlike HR, unlike GST and TDS, you know, which they are modules, the working capital is a very integral part of your finance. You know, it's a, basically what you're talking is inventory data creditor. 
so it actually has to be within your uh, accounting software which you use even tally has a you know a module for a working capital in fact one uh, the the uh, accounting software we use we customize it so it can report us both accrual basis accounting and cash basis accounting so what i'm trying to uh, answer is that every software has to be customized based on what kind of reporting you want out of it on a working capital but i don't think there are off the shelf uh, softwares available just to monitor because it has to be then integrated with your main financial accounting system yeah absolutely there is one more gentleman who has asked a question the new normal needs new models looking forward to uh, ideas just to do that well definitely models and we talked about models with randa and uh, but any any of you gentlemen would like to add about this anything to enlighten uh, this uh, gentleman so we can put it sudeep whether it's a new normal whether it's a new abnormal you know it's a different thing so uh, at the end of the day every business will evolve every business is we have learned how to do new businesses i mean in the sense e-commerce which used to be 1 1/2% of our industry suddenly it has become 3 to 4% of our industry so you know uh, different channels will behave very differently and uh, new business models will evolve in the sense uh, you know earlier we were not doing these type of conferences on you know on these type of webinars and we were all there in a conference you know in in hotel rooms and uh, banquets so this is a new way of doing you know all these type of discussions so every industry will go through a new paradigm change and i think change is constant so it will we all will learn to this and earlier we learn i think better it is for all of us yeah absolutely correct see there is another very interesting question has come and i'd like to try and answer this Reliance has been able to attract huge investment during pandemic. It is excess liquidity worldwide, or confidence of economy stability in India. I, I, let me put it this way: I think the businesses for which Reliance is attracting capital uh, globally attracts huge amount of money. Look at the largest global companies, retail. See, retail is where uh, Walmart is operating. Retail is where Amazon is operating, and these are the two largest companies in the world. Uh, and pretty much any other part in the world you go you see these retail companies retail uh, commerce companies are the biggest companies so this business would have attracted capital india is a large country with large potential market so they would have attracted money anyway second business where they attracted huge amount of money is a telecom and, uh, you know internet telecom combined so that's 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 it. that's again if you look at what is the competitive or what is the comparable position in the world you have the facebooks you have the googles you have the other large telecom players now they all have been attracting capital for decades across the world yes in india probably we were not ready now probably we are ready and also you are absolutely right the world is absolutely flooded with liquidity every single central bank in the developed part of the world has injected liquidity like there is no tomorrow whether it's us uk ecb uh, japan china so there is enough and more liquidity which are chasing good businesses perceived good businesses and you know as we say in financial market terms there is a risk on mood amongst the investors and that's pretty much what swung the uh, pendulum in favor of reliance So that's uh, on reliance, and uh, I, I gave my two bit pieces. Then there is another interesting observation: Jyoti and Matrimony are both healthy companies, and largely into products unaffected by COVID. The bigger challenge would be marginal to middling companies. What would be the prescription to these companies? Some of these have had operational uh, break apart from working capital challenges. I think it's absolutely correct. Nitin, would you like to comment on this? Can you just repeat, sorry, uh, Sudeep? Can you repeat the question? So it's very interesting. They said Jyoti and Matrimony are both healthy companies and largely into products unaffected uh, uh, by COVID. The bigger challenge would be marginal to middling companies. What would be the prescription to these companies? Some of these uh, have had operational uh, break apart from working capital challenges. You would have seen. Why, clients, uh, yeah. So I think I totally agree. i think for the mid size company i have my two bits would be one is to evolve at a business model so as you know every company is coming with a new business model so i have to have a healthy cash flow and the second biggest thing is if you can't generate revenue 
control your cost because ultimately profit is nothing but revenue minus cost. So if you have a control on cost, as Sushant has said, Q1 was even better than Q4. It is purely because costs were under a complete leash. So I think for mid-sized companies, cost is more very, very, very critical. And for revenue side, you need to generate new business models. Excellent. Thank you. There's one gentleman who has made a comment rather than a question. Cash flow is human intelligence and nothing can replace it. Well, everything is pretty much uh, uh, human intelligence and intelligent people or intelligent ways of working can manage things even in a crisis better than if you are not handling it intelligently. Absolutely correct. Uh, with that, I think I hand over to Kim. Uh, Kim? Thank you so much. Um... So, good afternoon, everyone, once again. And on behalf of ASA, I would like to extend my deepest thanks and appreciation to our excellent chair, Sudeep, our stellar panelists, S. Ranganathan, uh, Sanjay, Sushant, and Nitin. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all of the thought that you put into this and the experience that you brought to the table for us today. All was put together, made for an absolutely excellent discussion. A few key takeaways, uh, at least for me, were how cash management is going to be an essential part of the daily dashboard of the C-suite, uh, how the power of digitization and just how critically important data analysis is to real-time agile decision-making, and finally, the importance of converting your vendors and customers into business partners. I would also like to thank the team at ASA for putting together this event and this series, Manoj, for ensuring a smooth rollout of the series, came out for his stylist support in organizing today's panel. And finally, I would like to thank everyone who attended today for taking the time out and joining us on the session. If there are any further questions, please email them to us and we will get back to you. We will be sending across a summary of the points that were discussed along with a recording of the session tomorrow. Please join us next week on Wednesday, October 21st at 3 p.m. again for the next panel discussion on tax planning. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Sudeep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.